Yes. So 35 minutes, including 30 minutes of uh, of uh, presentation and maybe five minutes of uh, Q&A. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, today I would like to present uh, our uh, study on Mega World, which is a multiplayer educational game platform that can be used for anything and for every every kind of languages. My name is Michael Zhang. I'm coming from Asabasca University, Canada. So Mega World is a web-based multiplayer educational game platform which teachers they can create their own virtual world directly without paying anything and they can create as many as the world they want. And then inside the world they can have their non-player characters created, they can have their learning quest created, they can have their learning reward created. And then students, they can get online and then go through all the learning quests, the learning quest chains and then learn something or practice something or self-assess uh, their knowledge. So that is the mega world. So mega world is web best and it is a money player and it support any language. So no matter what kind of language you are using, you can create a virtual world for that kind of language and the content. And it can external link to any kind of web resources. So as long as your source, your resource is online, then you can connect it inside of Mega World. And then teacher they can create their own world and the students they can learn. So that is what we propose this Mega World. This Mega World has um, proposed since 2009 and until now it has already been uh, many years. So, right now, the web-based mega world has uh, support 12 kinds of learning activities. So it's including calculation, conversation, fill in the blank, greeting, item collection, and multiple choice, show answer, single choice, sorting, speaking, trigger hunting, and so on. I, in this uh, presentation, I will mainly focusing on the conversation show answer, speaking, and trivial hunting. And of course, because we want the teacher to be able to use directly, so we have a word map editor, quest editor, and the people, they can expand their word very easily. Um, and uh, by the way, because this is a multiplayer educational game, so people, they can talk uh, in the chat. So, this is the mega world. If you want, you can go to this uh, system, uh, https megaworld.gameserver.ca, and you will see this. This is a kind of user interface. You will see that, uh, and you can click on Play Now to register an account freely. So this is the mega world looks like, and uh, let me see. Here is, uh, I think there is uh, animation, yes. Okay, so basically if you are a student, you can create an account and then you can move around the world and you can pick up the quest from the NPC. Of course, those quests or those assignments, they are made by teachers. And um, when you do anything, you can uh, get uh, your uh, experience point. So you can level up, you can also get a virtual gold, so you can purchase something. And uh, of course, uh, when you level up, you can see a more complicated, more challenging uh, quest. So you can purchase something. Why you want to purchase a brain? Because when you are moving in the world, you are uh, you spending your energy. So when your energy becomes zero, then you cannot uh, go anywhere. So you need to purchase some foods. And in order to purchase food, you need to have virtual gold. In order to get virtual gold, you need to pass the quest. And uh, you can see other people, and you can also talk to other people in any kind of languages you want. So that is what we have. And of course, we kind of to think of the virtual world concept. So you will not be able to talk someone 
far, far away. So you can also only talk to someone within a certain period of the, the range. And of course, you can purchase item to increase that range. So that is another reason why you want to do the learning quest. Because when you do the learning quest, you will get gold. And when you get gold, you can purchase lots of privilege. So when you open the virtual world, actually you can see this is a chat. This is what the learning quest you have. This is you, and of course your experience point, your level, and this is inside of your bag. When you are taking the quest, you will, you will need to be a profession. So basically, a profession is mapping to a learning subject. So if you are a teacher, you can create a virtual world that has many professions. Or you can create each of the world that mapping to a profession. So in that case, you can divide your student into different virtual world. And then in each of the world, they will become a profession, for example, a calculator or a, um, a Churchill hunter, which means they may need to be very uh, good in mathematics. And you can divide the, the level of the profession, which means they can get a level up to another profession as long as they finish all the quest for this profession. So uh, in this case, I would like to use one of the uh, examples that we collaborated with uh, the Educational University of Hong Kong. So in, that, uh, in their world, they have four professions because they create a virtual world called Hogwarts. So Hogwarts, they have a first year Hogwarts student, second year Hogwarts student, and so on. You, you need to finish all the quests for the first year so you can level up to another profession and see other quests. Here is a, a quest that is sorting. So you can see that you get something and you need to sort by drag and drop something on the, on the screen and then present it to the NPC. So you need to know the order and the sequence of some concepts or workflow. On the other hand, this is a treasure hunting. So when you see a treasure hunting quest, it will provide you some kind of coordinates. For example, I want you to go to computer library, or I want to go to MIT to search for this uh, literature. So actually, this quest is finding the literature, and this quest is belonging to research methodology course. So. The NBC asks you to go to MIT library, which is at 4.1, and you can need, you need to dig out a literature by using a computer, computer device. So when you move to that place, you can use your computer device, so you can find an article. You collect those article, and then you read, and you can uh, answer the question from NBC, then you success and uh, you, you got the quest. Another um, quest is speaking quest, which means you cannot type. The only way you interact with computer is talk. So basically this kind of quest can be uh, some kind of language learning because you cannot type. You need to talk in Chinese or English or in any kind of language. And uh, let me see if I can Click up here, because uh, in Mac, it seems that we're not automatically, where is my mouse cursor? I cannot go to my, can I click uh, because I cannot, uh, oh yes, yeah, can you, no, can you click, let me see, uh, I think this is a, hmm. okay, this is a video, uh, but the, okay, yes, so you can see that uh, when you, It is okay. So you can see that uh, actually when you are, this is a quest that belonging to uh, uh, Okay, it's actually it's done. So, um, but, uh, but I have more so I can do this later. 
Okay, so you can see that uh, this kind of quest actually is an English speaking test, which is one of the questions that ask you to describe your So you can see that after you finish your your um, your quest, you uh, the NPC will try to mark it with our auto marking service, which is trying to compare uh, your sentence with what we expect you to say uh, in natural language processing. So you you will need to wait a little bit back uh, moment and then come back to the NPC to get uh, your marks or your reward. On the other hand. This is <coughs> So if you have a quest, Congratulations. You have completed the task. So this is a conversation quest. If you don't understand Chinese, that is okay because as I said, make a word support any language. So I got a 91.42 points uh, for this, this conversation quest and also you can do another language. This one is for Spanish. Okay, the reason I show this. I only got um, 90 uh, something, 90 point. Thank you. Yeah, so you can see this is a kind of a conversation quest which if, if you are teaching language, you can use this way to making sure that the students, they can uh, teach, they can speak, speak in, in the language you are teaching and in your own way. So when you're trying to do the design, this is the problem. You need to create the course content and then you will try to create the virtual world. And for example, like here, we have five uh, maps. So in that case, you need to making sure that the, the five maps, they can um, you know, connect together without any problem. And once you have different maps, you can create your NPC. And you can have many NPCs, and then you start to create your quest. So each of the quests, you may have your own design for different kind of quest type, different kind of content, and so on. So this is what we have. And um, uh, of course, this is a video just showing that how many pages you may have for uh, designing a course uh, content, how much time you will need. In this case, um, we spend like um, 40 days. 
40 days to complete the, the whole, whole virtual world with uh, the quest and so on. And uh, when you have this documentation, then you can start to using the user interface. See, we have uh, many user interface which can accelerate uh, and uh, reduce your workload. So you can try to create your virtual world uh, by using this way easily. You can create your own NPC directly according to your game, doc game design document. And uh, then we are doing a pilot. So you can see at uh, University right now we have uh, four undergraduate and graduate level courses including Java programming and uh, research methodology and the history of psychology. We intentionally try to create the course for different kind of subject and domain. So each of them they have virtual world, NPC and the quest. For Java programming course we have four maps and we have 24 NPCs. We have 10 levels in which we have 108 quests. So which means if students they want to use this virtual world to learn Java programming, they can complete 108 quests within the 10 levels and they will travel among the four maps. So, so in, this, in this paper, we are trying to give you a pilot so we have 11 students, they were asked to use Mega Word, but that, that is not required. That is just optional. So they can use this for a self-assessment tool. And then they voluntarily to report their perceptions toward Mega Word, whether or not they have seen this kind of things before, and also whether or not they want to use this, and whether or not they think Mega Word can replace a formal assessment, like a final exam. So nine users, they provide their opinions, but there's only seven we keep, because two of them, they, uh, they actually, they are playing another virtual world, not our Java programming course. So uh, their opinions cannot be really uh, uh, considered in this, uh, this case study, because we are talking about Java programming course. So, First of all, each of them, they are played 17 to 18 minutes, and then they solve 10 to 12, 25, 25 quests. So you need to think, think about this. 17 to 18 minutes, you can solve 10 to 25 quests, but you still remember we have how many? 108, right? So in that case, they, most of them, they say, the questions are easy, not difficult. Of course, because we have 108 quests. And then one user rate 7 out of 10 for the difficulty level. And uh, haven't, haven't they seen this kind of game before? Actually, five of them they, are, they haven't seen before, and uh, also uh, only one had seen before, but not in multiplayer educational game. Whether or not this can be a self assessment to us, actually, uh, almost everyone agrees. Only one doesn't agree because he said that he or she says he pre prefer quiz and uh, automated uh, coding uh, grading. Okay, and then uh, you can see that uh, all suggest that you have a more difficult quest. But uh, this is what we want to say because they only spend two hours, uh, sorry, couple of uh, hours to play the game. So they only played uh, only one, one fourth of the game. And then uh, you can see that uh, whether or not they think they can uh, use this mega word to replace the formal assessment. Actually, all of them, they are very positive. And one of them even says that uh, uh, because they, I, got, I get very stressed and overwhelmed on exam, I will think this platform would lighten uh, this aspect for me. But uh, also people, they suggest that uh, having some supervision, so Mega Word is not considered as an open book exam. So this is something that the people, they think. I just want you to know that this result, so once again, 70 to 80, and 10 to 12, 20 to 25 quests. And uh, remember, Mega Word is a quest that uh, people, they only to play at the end of the last second week, which means there is only one week left until they write the exam. So they cannot put more hours to play the game. 
And uh, that is our recommendation. So if you want to adopt this kind of things, please start at the beginning. And the people, they can pray again from time to time. You again pray, your request can follow your syllabus. And then they can pray and pray and pray. So in that case, when, when they reach to write an exam, they will um, almost learn everything. So this can do anything, self-assessment or uh, pre-learning and other things. So anyway, you can feel free to register this game uh, for playing and uh, we have already published Mega Award research uh, for many. And uh, right now we have a chat, G not a chat GPT, sorry, we have an Eskimo summary that uh, people they can ask a course content question uh, in the game. And it's very fast, it's, it's about only 0 0.6 seconds to respond to the student's question. So thank you so much and uh, yeah. There is any question? Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yes, please. Uh, all right. So, when you are designing and planning a new course, do you have a template to say that what needs to be defined? Maybe you can go behind. Oh, the as as I, you see from this, yes, we do have a, a kind of a template because, uh, but uh, this kind of a template actually is created by student. So, uh, so when students they create this kind of quest, they found that it will be better to list this and then you fill out and then it will be better. Then you start thinking from scratch. Yeah, which is exactly why I think it will be helpful to have a template if you want to register an account to use your system. Yeah, we can, we, can, uh, we can provide this kind of template for, for any, any users because our system is open access, so we can provide this kind of document in, in um, our landing page. So. Thank you very much. No Sorry, I, I hope they understood the question. Another, next. Next. Yes, uh, Weixin, behind. Thank you, Mekai. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, it seems like a, a, a complicated uh, system for teachers to manage. And uh, I guess they, for people who do not have a very, <laughs> very high IT skills, it might be challenging to, to learn and to spend time if they have invested uh, time to learn and to, uh, to make courses. Um, so. What is the outcome? Do, do students learn better in the system than um, in traditional way of uh, classroom teaching and uh, ex exercise in labs? Yeah. Sorry, I might miss your no problem. Your earlier. Yes, you are you are correct. So when we created this uh, full class, actually they are not uh, sorry full. For virtual world, for full courses, actually they are not created by teacher. So uh, for these three courses, actually we have uh, one student mapping to the professor, and they they co they collaborate and create all the virtual worlds and the quests together. So basically, teachers or professors they are just uh, talking, just uh, presenting. Oh, I want to teach this. I want to evaluate this. And then students, they create those quests because they are familiar with IT, they are familiar with game, and so on. But I need to tell you that uh, who created these three courses, those students, they, they don't play game. They never played game before, but, uh, but they can uh, follow the, um, the, the management system and then they can discuss with the teachers and professors. With the uh, learning effect, actually right now you can see that when we do the pilot, we are mainly consider to see whether or not the makeup world can do the self-assessment. So we are not consider uh, to let them learn in the game. So basically they are still learn in the class, in the normal course, but we wanted to, uh, first of all, can we 
ask the students who want to pray again, don't like to write the, write the exam, to pray this game, and then we get a, a, a score for them. So uh, that is uh, some kind of goal we wanted to do. But of course, this platform can also be used for learning. But uh, uh, we don't have that yet. We wanted to collaborate with some of you. If you want to use Bingo Word, then we can allocate uh, a student to work with you to create the game word, and then we can do the evaluation to see whether or not the students that use Bingo Word can learn better or more. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, sorry, because of the time constraint, I, I have to use uh, the last chance to ask a question as the IDC workshop chair. Can you use just one minute to connect your work with IDC theory? So, this, this is interesting, right? <laughs> so, okay, but I would like to remind you, not everyone needs or not everyone will want to use this. As you can see, one of the students, he or she says, I like a quiz best system, not a get best system. So interest driven is very important. They, if they are uh, a gamer, they like playing game, they don't like to read a book, they don't like to write an exam, then we can use. And uh, continuously, not just a one shot, one month, one hour, but uh, starting from the beginning of the course, they then use, and until the end, then it uh, can have a better experience, I believe. So hopefully it's uh, related <laughs> to IDC. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, our first panel uh, to be chaired by uh, Dr. Sulam, uh, Professor Sulam Wong. Uh, but I also need to apologize that because of what happened is that uh, I personally have another paper to present at a different workshop. At this time, I, will, I think the times will be over, over short. So I will leave the uh, I will leave uh, uh, Sudan's uh, leave this workshop to Sudan's good hand until the end of this panel. So uh, I will need to excuse myself for now. Uh, so now we take over until the tea break. Thanks, Lucian. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we are now at the uh, first panel, which is Fusing Ideas for Engaging Learning from Interest-Driven Creator Theory to Seamless Interest-Driven Co-Creator Theory for Learning Design. I am your chair. We have uh, four panelists here, and uh, just for your information, we actually have the How Well website already up and running, so you can actually scan the QR code to have a look at this uh, new website here, which tells you more about the SIDC theory. So when I invited the four panelists, I had actually provided some guiding questions, six questions, which would actually help them uh, prepare their uh, talk for today. You can also get this from the uh, QR code, and uh, there's more inside the website, so I do encourage you to have a look yeah, at uh, this website. So without further ado, may I now invite the first panelist. Yeah? So Maida, you will have to go first again. Yeah? And then followed by Wen Li. Wen Li, are you here? Okay. Uh, Julie, and lastly, Long Kai. All right. So we have uh, 12 minutes for each speaker, and uh, the remaining time will be kept for Q&A. So I hope that um, you will keep to the time, because we are running quite late, actually, my God. So over to you. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, I, I can, uh, of course, I cannot answer all the questions here. Uh, so basically, first of all, I would like to remind you, interest driven. So you need to know the student's interest first. Or engage them, get them motivated. If they don't like it, how can you get them motivated? And then, because they have an interest, then that will be fine. Uh, this, after, this morning, I just uh, talked to uh, Professor uh, Mizoguchi uh, Ritiro about my history of learning uh, Japanese uh, because when I was young, I tried to create a game. And uh, by that time, the only game console we have is Nintendo. 
and all the games they are in Japanese. So if you don't understand Japanese, how can you learn? How can you play the game? So in order to do that, I need to self-learn Japanese, and uh, uh, that is a, a kind of interest-driven because I want to play the game with the Nintendo console, console, and the only game I can get is uh, in Japanese. So I need to do that. So this is the very same thing. So this is what I would like to address about the uh, fifth and the sixth uh, question. So the first thing is um, you need to either get the engage of your students if they are not interested in using this way to learn or in, in terms of learning this learning subject, how can you make them become interested? And uh, then once they have an interest, then you can try to use uh, a kind of a way to, to get them involved. So for example, like a game, you can try to use commercial games, or you can try to use like a mega word, create your own game words, and so on. But, but, once again, I would like to remind you another thing about game. Game is a game. Game is not a learning material. So don't put your learning material to the game directly, which will make the game very boring, and the people, they will not want to continue to use. So how can you convert the concepts into the game content? That will be actually the most difficult thing. That is why we invite the students to join the group, to work with the professor, because the professor only know the content. And the students, they can actually, they can imagine what kind of things they will like to learn, and so on. So, for example, let's take a look at the research methodology. So when we do the research methodology, the first thing is we need to do literature review. Okay, so where is the resource of literature review? Academic paper, right? Maybe book chapter, and so on. So how you put a list into a game? <coughs> okay, let's consider that you meet a farmer or you meet an NPC inside of game. The NPC will tell you that, oh, recently I'm so interested about Greek history. How, how should I do? Should I, should I learn Greek history from which resource? Should I try to learn the, the concept from TV or a movie or something? So basically, if you convert this concept into this way, then perhaps, perhaps the students they can learn. Okay, I need to use academic paper. I use, need to use a textbook or something, and then they learn. So. That is something you need to very, uh, be very, very uh, pay attention because don't just put your content into game directly. And then number six. So earlier we are talking about IDC, so interest-driven creator theory. But now we are talking about seamless interest-driven co-creator theory. So. There are, oh, oh, sorry, I missed the ethical. <laughs> okay, in my final answer, I'm not talking about uh, any, I'm just talking about any consideration, not an ethical uh, consideration. So when you are thinking about that, just like we said, when we are trying to use, the, use some technology, we are not use this technology for one hour two hours, one week. We should consider to use this technology from the beginning or even earlier to the end or after. And when we use this technology, you also need to re remind yourself that not everyone likes that technology. So in that case, how you connect the dot or provide them the dot, additional dot, so they can, okay, attend your classroom, read this book, 
read the list of material, and then pray again, and then come back to read, the, and then go back to pray again, and so on. So how to connect the, the dot, and uh, making sure that uh, uh, you provide everyone the, what they like, uh, that will be very important. And uh, from the beginning, or the earlier, or until the end, or after, many people, they consider the learning is only happening during the class. But you all know that the learning is actually will continue after the class or even before the class. I like to learn artificial intelligence because right now ChatGPT is so famous. That is your motivation. And you start to learning artificial intelligence before the class. And then you jump into the class. After the class, you will still try to learn something related after. So that is, uh, you need to consider a whole connection from the beginning or earlier to the end or after. Yeah, I think that is uh, what I want to say, but the, the, the second point is the successful story. As I said, you can see from uh, the paper we presented earlier, some people, they are so stressful when they are doing writing exam or something like that. So in that case, uh, we provide a mega word so they can also do uh, something uh, in their uh, most comfortable uh, way to finish the assessment so they can get a better performance. I just want you to know I am a very bad learner. Or says, I'm a good learner, but I'm very bad exam writer. So I don't like a writing exam. All of my course don't use writing exam because I don't trust the writing exam because under that stressful environment, how can you imagine people they can write everything they know in one hour, two hours, or three hours. So, and also you, when you are doing programming, you know no matter how experienced programmers, they will always go to the website and take a look at the resources. So when they do that in the closed book exam, they cannot really you know, show you what they can really do. So that is what uh, um, I want to say that uh, if you want to success, then you need to consider all the situation and the personal difference. I think that that is everything I want to say right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maiga, for answering some of the questions. Yeah. So as I said, uh, these are just the guiding questions. You mean, I mean, the panelists may have, um, you may want to share beyond what I have actually prepared for them. So um, we are actually, Maiga, you actually finished earlier than what I actually confused. <laughs> so we are right back on time now. So now can I, may I invite Wenli? Our next panel speaker. So as um, Wendy is preparing, yeah, um, please keep your questions and we will collect them at the end of the presentation. Nanyang Technological University. Okay, for today's uh, top minutes sharing, uh, I would like to focus on the two out of the six questions uh, raised up. Uh, by Suwa, our chair. So the first one is extension of the IDC theory to SIDC. Actually, the third question, it is uh, related to, I think, what kind of uh, strategies or ways are we are able to connect the different parts of the, the theory together. So the title of my presentation is a uh, seamless IDC, pervasive human AI synergy for preparing for lax learners. So I will, I'm going to explain what do I mean by four lives. Okay. So in my sharing, so actually at the beginning of the workshop, uh, uh, both uh, uh, Long Xiang and Sulan talk about the global how well, right? Uh, global how well actually is an ending goal, is an ultimate goal for education. But as a learning designer, so many of us, we are learning scientists and learning technologists. For us, we also need to think of what it is. Is there any intermediate goals or objectives uh, which could be more concrete for our learning designers to think about what are the things that we might be able to achieve before we are able to get ultimate goal? 
So here we like to talk about the lifelong, life wide, life deep, and the life wise learning. So um, in my presentation, I'm trying to unpack the relationship among these uh, three important concepts. Okay. So I think the first, the seamless IDC, uh, actually at the if you have read the abstract of the today's workshop, you roughly have some idea on what is that, right? So it is about the continuity of the IDC experiences across different scenarios or context. So it could be between formal learning context in the classroom and informal learning context out of the classroom. It could be between individual and social learning, between physical and digital worlds across the different time and the locations. So, and also across the different learning modes, okay? So, as you can see, the seamless IDC actually is in line with the lifelong and the life-wide learning very well. So, if we take a look of this life centers, uh, lifelong and the life-wide learning, uh, this kind of diagram, so we all noticed, uh, you know, because IDC itself, we are looking at a lifelong IDC uh, interest-driven creator, they are able to have this kind of habit at the end become a lifelong IDC, right? Uh, then life-wide. Life-wide actually the seamless part uh, because we want to um, remove the themes uh, between formal and informal learning context uh, by seamless IDC. So that's our, uh, hopefully we are able to design something to achieve this kind of goals. Okay. So next, let me explain why I'm thinking of this kind of four lines framework. Uh, could be the intermediate objectives or goals uh, between we are able to reach a global how well at the end. I'm not the person coined this term four lives. Actually, it first appeared at my institution, the Strategic Plan 2022. And it has also appears uh, in one of the publication here, uh, contributed by my uh, colleagues at NIE. So at NIE, and also in Singapore education system, we are looking at, so in terms of learning, what are we trying to offer? So we want to have a lifelong learning, right? Uh, I think that's part I, I don't have to explain the details, uh, but I, I guess many of us have a good understanding on what is that. And also life-wide learning. So I think this life-wide learning, the concept is quite different from the previous slides. I show you the life center, their definition of life-wide. They are looking at the, within the 24 hours of a day, so what are the periods that students do it in the informal learning, what part is in the informal learning. But for us uh, here, for life means that we want to see the adaptability and the transferability across different contexts of the learners. So it's not just about the time duration. And we hope students can have a mindful perspective and interdisciplinary understanding to be a more creative, uh, problem solvers and also creators to do some meaningful creation for the society and for the world. Okay, so next, life deep learning and life wise learning. Life deep learning, actually when we are introducing seamless learning concept in our graduate education courses at NIE, some students, they shared with us, Prof, what if, you know, they are able, there are so many, um, you know, uh, learning moments, but what if they touch and go? So which means that they learn at uh, might be very surface level. So we are looking into uh, life deep learning. So we hope they are able to have a deeper conceptual understanding of the things we want them to learn. And also they have a mastery of autonomy and uh, this kind of a purposeful learning. Yeah. Okay, so at the end, the life-wise learning. <laughs> life-wise learning, if we read the abstract of Prof Chan's, uh, you know, the talk of a tomorrow's a keynote talk, I think we want our students are not just a cognitively engaged, right? So we want them to be a happier learner. They are contributing to the society. They are have, they have a build up those kind of harmony from themselves between different people and to the society and maybe to the global world. So for this part, I think it is more about social emotional learning rather than just a cognitive learning. We hope they have a, a good values, morals, character and practical wisdom and historical empathy. So this is a, we are thinking maybe as a learning designer with this, it might be able to guide us uh, think about what kind of a learning design principles in specific context, which might be able to help us achieve a certain part of here. Okay, so uh, <laughs> another, this is a, 
in this September, Singapore Ministry of Education come out of this uh, Education Technology Master Plan 2030. So I may not have time to talk about everything details, but I just want to highlight one thing. Uh, everything needs to be human-centered. Yeah, because especially with the emergence of the AI, generative AI, chat GPT things, right? So we are quite afraid, you know, they become more tech driven rather than human driven. So we need to focus on human centered methodologies to discover the need and they develop solutions to real world problems. Okay, so we want students uh, to skillfully leverage a range of digital tools to create solutions. So this will actually have a lot of implications uh, to the learning designers, uh, at least in Singapore context. i uh, just share with you some of the context of Singapore. Yeah, Singapore, all the secondary school students, all of them, they have a personal learning devices. So infrastructure is not a problem. Uh, so the, now students, uh, yeah, my son is a sec secondary one. He's uh, bringing the laptop to school every day. Yeah. And if the teacher is not designing something using the ICT, teacher feel a bit awkward because all the students are having their laptop with them in the class. Okay. And the student's learning space, it is not hardware, it's a software. It's a national learning platform. So all the students, all the, no matter primary school, secondary school, or even general college, they all have access to this learning system. And the Ministry of Education of Singapore is developing this system. They are taking the agile strategy to keep developing them. There are also a lot of AI features embedded, a lot of good learning resources. So once one teacher develops the learning resources, it can be easily shared in this learning platform with the, the whole community, okay? And also another thing, generative AI, yes, it is fully embraced in school system, not just in higher education, but in primary school and secondary school. But we also need to be very cautious on those uh, downside of the AI. Yeah, so just to give you some of the context, okay? So in terms of the SIDC, I do feel in terms of a hardware and a software part for the learning scientists and the learning technologists in Singapore, we do have a good foundation because we don't have to think about whether the students have the devices. Okay, so this is uh, some of the AI literacy framework we are thinking. So learning about AI, learning from AI, but uh, what, what is more important now, now is uh, learning with AI. It's about co-generation and co-creation with AI. Perhaps in the near future, no more write or create from the scratch. Yeah, at least in the workforce, I think many of the industries, uh, we have no more starting from the scratch, right? We're co-generating with the AI. But no matter what, learners agency, humans agency, always need to be highlighted. So stu students and the learners, they need to reflect the critic and build upon. So when they are engaged in IDC, whether seamlessly, pervasively in what kind of context. When they are tapping on the affordances of the AI, learners, the agency need to be highlighted. So the, we are promoting create, critical, ethical, and responsible use of AI for their IDC. Okay, so the, this is a concept I always uh, you know, highlight at least in our courses, in our department. Human AI synergy for SIDC in the future. So it come from, you know, uh, many years ago, uh, David Johnson, they talk about ICT as a cognitive tools, right? So we always highlight this part, is that we are using technology as a cognitive tool to leverage the computing power of the technology while retaining the critical tasks of learning by learners. I think in the, in the era of the AI, it has also become very important. So we need to leverage the power of the AI to enhance the efficiency of the learning yeah, that AI can excel over humans, but we keep the human roles in the essential process of learning, such as creative thinking and creative thinking. Yeah, now with the AI are so publicly available and so powerful, when students are doing SIDC, it is also quite often they may just uh, get generative AI to generative ideas for them, create for them, not just create wisdom. So I think that let AI create something for the learner or create with the learner, they will inform the different set of the learning design principles. Okay, so in the uh, literacy in human AI 
uh, this kind of a synergy. So we are uh, proposing some kind of a framework. Right? In this framework, I think on top of those uh, knowledge, uh, what AI, how AI works, I think we need to teach our learners uh, skills on how to interact with AI to elicit appropriate information, which including you know, prompt engineering, how to evaluate the information elicited. Uh, uh, and on top of that, I think we students need to have a appropriate disposition towards AI, especially generative AI. So they not to be swayed by unrealistic promise or power of the AI. On the other hand, they are not to be threatened by the AI. Okay, okay. so this kind of a, a PERMA thing, uh, in the past few months, because I think Prof Chen recommend me to read this uh, framework and also read some kind of uh, books uh, in the area of uh, positive uh, psychology, right? So we hope this is a, actually is a well-being framework uh, this well-being framework, actually, if I think in this way, well-being framework, it could be the goal of the life. But the later on, I feel as a learning designer, if we think about this, keep this in mind, it will also inform us how to design the learning environment and the learning experience for our students. So, for example, we are, when we are looking at the human AI synergy, so what role we can play? So, positive. Uh, Emotions. Students need to have a positive experiences with AI. Yeah. So if we want to create any learning task or learning environment for them, so hopefully it can bring about positive experience engagement. They are fully immersed themselves with it. They are interacting in a meaningful way. Positive relationships. Okay. So in the original PERMA framework, this positive relationship is talking about a positive relationship between people, human being. But in this context, actually, is a positive but interdependent relationship between human and AI. Yeah, because now I think we all know how it works. Because like we keep asking questions, interacting with AI, right? Is a, so it can be very productive sometimes. Then the meaning, the meaning in the original PERMA framework, it is talk about students have a very good experiences with other people. Then at the end, they found the meaning beyond themselves. They found the meaning of their life, uh, you know, what for their friends, for the society, for the world. Actually, this is also something we hope our students are not just uh, using AI for fact checking. They need to create something, generate, uh, create, uh, create the ideas, and hopefully they are rise above, uh, go to the next level of their IDC. Yeah. At the end, there was a sense of accomplishment. Okay, so what are the, all the implications for learning designers? I think this is related to the third question uh, posed by you know, our chair here. Let them think about. So in the generative AI world, many people are asking us, what is your role? Now AI is so powerful. AI can interact with your students and the learners directly. What can you do, right? So this always keep to our mind. Of course, we can do two things. As a learning scientist, we can design some of learning concepts by using the AI. Learning technologists can also develop some kind of APIs, like tapping on the power of generative AI to make it more uh, intuitive and more meaningful and productive for students. So for example, for the learning designer, we can think about uh, and now when we are setting a learning task, uh, we have to go Beyond those, uh, just uh, you know, write the, uh, the essay. What are the pros and the cons of this? Uh, because genetic AI now they can do a better job than many of the human learners. So we can think about. Uh, we can ask students to compare their own work and with the work generated by AI and uh, compare the similarities, uh, differences, and think about uh, how to rise above what they have learned from AI. What part they feel AI is not reliable. Okay, so this is good for the metacognition and higher order thinking. Then they can also co-creation with the AI. Actually, this is always a very interesting part for, for the learning scientist. So in what way they can have a very productive kind of interactions? I think in this area, co-creation with AI for SIDC could be a big area. So in, in the next few years. So one, just share with this is my last slide, if I have, still have time to talk about it. Just now I share with you, people is always asking us what teacher can do, what the professor can do in the 
era of a generative AI, things that students are interacting with the AI directly, yeah, without a, a human teacher on site. Actually, this is one of the examples I'm sharing with you. My department had developed uh, such an API called the Teacher Gaia in just a few months ago. So for us, now, when students are interacting with uh, generative AI, generative AI answers the question in a very generative way. Now, actually, we have uh, created uh, three learning experiences. In the prompt engineering, we've already programming with the generative AI so that when AI interacting with the students, uh, they are going to towards that kind of direction. One of the learning mode is increase based learning. Once, the once it is in increase learning mode, now generative AI won't uh, provide a direct answer to the students if the students ask them the question. Instead, they are going to ask some questions. For example, AI will say, so what is your hypothesis? Do you have a alternative explanations? So before just feeding up all those kind of questions, we feel this is also a very powerful way to scaffold our students in terms of higher order thinking, in terms of interest-driven creation, right? So rather than always wait answers, wait ideas generated from AI. So we also have other learning mode like a self-assessment mode, because we feel this is one part that learning scientists can contribute to this area, yeah, because we know what are those important learning design principles, we know what are the important keywords for prompt engineering, uh, which AI scientists may not have the uh, same level of uh, knowledge as us. So I believe learning scientists and AI scientists need to work together to bring this kind of work to the next level. Okay, so this is end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for your very interesting slides and uh, sharing. So next we have Julie. National Central University, Taiwan, and currently I'm affiliated with Brunel University, London, as a visiting scholar. Uh, my topic is SIDC now and then. I'm trying to answer three of the above questions. The first one is um, showing a, a, a case study. And as many of you might have known, that I have been designing games for education. And for this case, is we have uh, created games based on historical context and historical scenarios, and we implemented in the in the IDC experimental school in Taiwan. Um, we see uh, students. We, we see students are are. We see students. We see gaming have already simulated a simulated interest from the students and the gaming also helped the students to reflect on learning and SID, in SIDC it has highly promoting as MSSR the models sustainable silent reading and by using the games the students can connect the content of the game with the reading that they learn in the in the classroom and the gaming experience also extends their discussion. So when we were guiding the students playing the games in the classrooms, the students were really immersed uh, in the gaming scenario. They are highly devoted and they interact and participate in the discussions and reflections. So uh, in my lab, we designed many, many games based on uh, using using authentic scenarios, simulated scenarios, and fictional scenarios. For those many games, we have two major uh, goals. The first one is to 
uh, stimulate the students to have historical thinking. And the other one is to ask the students to tackle the, comp the challenging issues. So we are linking SIDC, the IDC theory, uh, into this case. Now the second question is, when we are moving into the digital future, what do we do? Uh, as I just said, uh, we created historical scenarios in the game. The students, were, they role play the characters in the game. So uh, we, now we are creating online platforms for seamless access, uh, letting, the student, uh, letting the AI as a student's learning companion and also for researchers for learning analytics. So generative AI is coming. So as I just said, uh, we want to use generative AI for two specific purposes. Uh, the first one is Gen AI as gaming strategic companion. Uh, the players, when they are role playing the characters in the game and they are working in their own team, their their teams, AI will be part of their team member, and the students use AI as the AI consultant. So they were. Uh, get extra historical content, scenario references, and their gaming strategies from AI and for their decision making. The second purpose is using Gen AI as automated an analysis tool. So with the, assist, the assistance of computer, uh, we are using the AI to do automatic annotation uh, detection function and to make it as an annotation system. So the AI will do the encoding and visualization automatically for us, for the researchers. So this is what we do. Uh, we get materials from the external World Wide Web for historical, for historical content and making it into gaming issues so the students work in groups to make decisions in our game. So in this process, the AI will work, we use AI as the, here, as the AI consultant. In this process, students will learn how to ask good questions. They will give good, com they, they will have to learn to give good comment, comment to the AI, and they also have to check the correctness of the resources and then use information appropri appropriately in the process. And also on the other side, while we are doing the research of this gaming process, uh, AI is, we, we use AI as the coding agent. So researchers have to use correct construct to analyze whatever we get from the gaming process. And we will have to use it to define good features, make correct character, categorization, and do visualization. To answer the, three, the third question, whether do we have new insights for SIDC? And I come up with three suggestions. Uh, the first one is we can use SIDC as the theoretical infrastructure. IDC was generated in the, from Asia. Uh, and also it's used, in, in, in our case, we use it in primary and secondary education. But we think uh, IDC can also be used in higher education, not only in Asia, but also in America or Europe. Uh, we think the learning interest can go from childhood to lifelong learning, and it reflects to what Professor Wendy just said about lifelong and life-wise learning. The second one is we can use IDC as the initiative of change. Uh, just now I said IDC is oriented from Asia, but we can actually broaden it to be used in the countries beyond Asia. Um, we can use it as a pedagogical conceptual change uh, world worldwide and the reach is global. The third one is we can use SIDC as the educator's manifesto. IDC can be used as the premises of paradigm shift. We are in Asia and we normally do our education using the um, test-oriented education. But now we are changing it into interest-driven and it is a big paradigm shift. And I think we can use 
uh, IDC as the core and the game and the guidance of the discourse for educational reform and with our efforts, the global efforts with the international scholars together, we, I think the dialogue between us can be reflexive and then the evolution can be progressive. And I'm making this uh, introduction really short and we all welcome questions later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Very insightful. Sharing. And now may, may I uh, invite our last speaker, last but not least, Long Kai. The applause is yours. I just want to share a case about how to apply the... I think this study is really inspired by the IDC theory before. I think this is still done by one of the in NIE. So uh, I think it provides a case of how... I don't know whether at that time it's IDC is not coming, coming out. But it is... Uh, I try to make sure that uh, interest can be integrated in the school curriculum, and then we try to try to like advancing interest-driven education in Singapore schools. It is a very small case, but I think it can be a bit inspiring. So, uh, so in this study, we we try to say that uh, this our uh, schooling. So, in, in this for the keys, that the schooling keys, uh, the about eighty percent of the keys. Time uh, will be spent outside of the classroom, and uh, and we have tension between the informal learning and the formal learning. Okay, and then how can we mitigate the tension? That is a question we are facing, and then we want to really about the make the connection between the formal and informal environment. So we create this uh, project uh, and uh, we aim to make learning occurs in both formal and informal settings and uh, in an orchestrated manner and by amplifying interest through the informal approach with the formal learning spaces. So this is the, this is the uh, target we want to see and we want to create an interest-rich learning environment in formal school settings. I think that's the purpose of that uh, study. And uh, we, we are trying to interplay between the, we, we want to bridge the formal and informal learning spaces and then try to identify the real interest and then try to see whether this kind of interest identification could uh, improve the learning performance. And then the question is, how teachers can leverage students' interest in academic learning by bridging formal and informal learning spaces, and how how does the bridging can inform interest-driven education? So this is the major three questions we have in mind, and we we did this study in a Singapore school, and uh, as you see that uh, it's on the P4 P4 students, and uh, we have the five school science teachers, and we have one uh, science HOD, and we have uh, eight P4 uh, students, so half in experimental, half in control class. And then we try to design a questionnaire, try to determine what the, the interest, the interest generates, uh, general interests are, and then try to do the in differentiate instruction. Okay, so we have this kind of descriptive mixed method and we, we have this kind of interest survey and then we also do the post uh, pre-post survey test and then on, on the topics of heat and of light to check the conceptual understanding. Okay, as you can see that uh, 
For the experimental class, we first design a questionnaire to ascertain what interests are, and then with the teachers, we co-design the learning activities on the five student interest groups and uh, uh, create, try to create uh, authentic connections between their interest and the science concepts in the classroom. So this is really, we are trying to introduce this kind of uh, informal interest in the formal classroom settings. Okay? And then with the knowledge of all students who were generally interact, uh, were interested in, we then designed a lesson plan that introduced science concepts that were linked to four main uh, interest uh, groups. And uh, you can see that uh, we have like uh, perform arts, arts, uh, we have four, uh, four class, four, four groups. And then we also use the SLS uh, platform because this is, this is online platform. I think it is uh, promoted by Singapore's MOE. And then this uh, SLS student learning space really provides students access to resources and learning, learning tours, which they can retrieve anytime. And uh, this online system also allows students to, f allow the students with the flexibility in learning and it means that they can access to the resources at any time, at home or at schools. Okay, and finally this is about creation. Okay, I did see creation. So in, in the end of the semester, they have the challenging uh, tasks they, they need to implement. Okay, and then they'll, they can do the mini uh, projects and encourage students to work independently and develop prototypes and based on the challenging tasks they were interested in and then you can see that they have really created many many uh, uh, interesting uh, cartoons, uh, cartoons and then you can see their creativity is like uh, inspired by their interest okay so we have several findings okay uh, we try to identify the interest. So as you see, we have the five, I think the five groups, arts, games, okay, nature, and uh, performing arts, and uh, sports. So this is the five interest groups we have, in, we have identified in the, in the classroom. And then we designed the learning task based on their interests. Okay, and we can see this kind of interest-based uh, differentiated curriculum can really uh, affect their learning, okay? And then we have certain positive, uh, I, I, as you can see that uh, it can really change in their interest in science if we can try to do this kind of uh, differential learning, if differentiate instruction based on the interest, they have certain uh, positive changes in their attitudes towards science. Okay, and then we also try to see that, uh, we also see that uh, the control, as we, we, we try to compare the control class and, uh, and uh, experimental class, so we can see that uh, the improvement of the arts group and the sports group have been the most fully laudable. In the overall role, the experimental class has witnessed an overall improvement, which is better than the control class. Okay, and then this is about the teachers. Okay, the teachers, we can see that uh, this is really about the contextual personalization. So teachers, how teachers can be more prepared to design the curriculum based on the students' different interests. That is a challenge in school settings. Whether, school, whether teachers have this kind of energy, have this kind of time to do this kind of customization, so this is, uh, this is, this is, uh, so we, we try to make sure that uh, uh, teachers can have certain TPD, so we discuss with the teachers, and then we design, uh, the, we, we co-design the lessons with the teachers, and then we can see that uh, students can be more familiar uh, with the learning contact materials they need to access, and then they find the learning to be more enjoyable. Okay, 
And then this is about impact of on teachers, and because teachers are the primary implementation of an intervention, they play a significant role in ensuring a smooth transition between the intended and the implemented programs. And then, so I think the teachers really have certain resistance at the very beginning, okay? And then at the end of the semester, so I think when they see the effects, when they see the, see the some positive effect, effects of this kind of approach, I think that they can still welcome such a customization uh, approach. Okay, and then this is about the uh, how, how in, the world, in what ways do teaching and learning within academic curriculum reinforce to hinder the development of interest-driven learning? I think this is, in schools, this is the emphasis on the design thinking uh, protocols. And the science HOD feels that the design thinking language can still be applied when an interest-driven approach is used. HOD also intends to introduce collaboration at the department level, promoting interdepartmental integration. I think that's a very uh, positive sign as we can uh, see in the in the schools. Okay, so as to the contribution of this study, we find this at the theory level, policy level, practice, uh, practice and the teacher PD level. And uh, in, the, uh, in the theory level, I think it's, uh, I don't know whether it can be a rich contribution to the IDC or SIDC uh, theory. Actually, I think it is one of the earliest implementation of interest-based curriculum in Singapore, as, as I guess, okay. At the, at the policy level, we can see that uh, it is really, because Singapore's MOE uh, also, as many my, uh, I guess I mentioned before about learning for life, okay? And uh, this is uh, interest, is appro interest-based approach can really be, uh, be uh, I think it's uh, interesting or attractive to policy makers. So as to the practices and uh, teacher PD, so uh, we can see that uh, uh, so the discussions with teachers revealed that uh, they recognize so the usefulness of such uh, approach. And however, the, it is it's successful implementation in schools is dependent on how it is scaffolded within the curriculum and uh, how the input time is can be provided. For I think for both teachers and uh, students. Okay, so as to the con conclusion of this study, we can see this this study really provides example or case of how interest-based learning or ITC can be enacted in schools with alignment to the curriculum. I think that's the challenge we are facing: how we can really integrate formal and the informal settings. I think that's the I think that's a main challenging I can witness how SIDC can be really implemented or take root in school settings. So if we are just talking about uh, for informal settings, I think SIDC may not be so attractive because as we say that in Asia, this is a high pressure uh, system, right? Education system, okay? Every, every student wants to have a, a good score. So when we try to introduce such interest-based approach or IDC or SIDC approach in schools, we need to be aware about this kind of how it can be enacted with the, with the informal curriculum. And this is done by connecting learning in both the formal and informal settings by amplifying interest through the informal approach into the formal learning space, okay? And we also capitalizing the, the students' interest we can see that this really helped them to develop skills and competencies that go beyond routine cognitive uh, tasks and supporting their ability to critically seek and uh, synthesizing information outside of the formal curriculum. So I think this is a very uh, small uh, case study. So hopefully this study can be uh, a bit helpful in implementing uh, SIDC, uh, I think in Asia, because I still think uh, Singapore is better in implementing such uh, experiments because now I'm in central China, Number University. I think 
uh, it becomes very hard for me to do such uh, to do such a very specific or small scale study. <laughs> so I think this interest best approach or IDC or SIDC approach is still very attractive. And I also try I will also try to implement such a such a approach in mainland China. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Long Kai. Um, we have actually overshot our time. It's really time for uh, a short break, but I think we can actually bring our coffee into uh, here and we can continue with the Q&A session. So just, just let me summarize uh, very quickly yeah, the four speakers. The first speaker, we had Maiga, who shared about the mega world and how he actually used or explained that self-interest. Yeah? Uh, started with he wanted to learn Japanese and he was interested in learning, using the games and how interest actually made him learn something new. Then we have um, Wendy who introduced the lifelong, life wide, life deep, and life wise concept, followed by Juling who shared with us about the game for uh, historical learning, and lastly, of course, uh, but not least, Lu Long Kai who shared with us some empirical data yeah, how bridging school-based formal and informal learning space. So I think we have covered all the questions that I posed to all speakers. Thank you so much for actually answering, trying so hard to answer. You've done so well. And uh, now I'm going to open uh, to the floor. If you have any questions to pose to any of the speakers or if you would like to share your ideas and opinions with us. Yes, Michelle. Uh, so I'm interested in the prompt engineering. You talk about learning designers. Hey, you have a vocabulary for prompting. Mm. Alright, so maybe you're talking about certain keywords. Actually, in prompt engineering, there's this thing about chain of thought, zero shot, one shot, few shots. Is it the same or a different thing that we're talking about? I think it's different things. They're related. I think the prompt engineering, because this the, the, the field is still developing, I think we are not expecting all the young learners to understand the, the you know what is prompt engineering, but we want them to be to learn how to ask good questions to generative AI. On our side, actually through the API divided by the learning side to learning technologies, we are mitigating the process between the young learner and the prompt engineering. Yeah, because the is a big gap. Yeah, yeah. So so. We, we see, and with our knowledge in those uh, learning design principles, we might be able to make those kind of uh, learning experiences, uh, uh, questions uh, or answers provided by AI more learning oriented rather than very generic. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. Any more questions or opinions that you'd like to share with us? Thank you for your presentation. I'm actually interested in um, generative AIs to support students. I was wondering if um, in your experiments there were any cases where you considered informing um, LLMs about the student's profile. For instance, there are other learning analytics methods that we can use to find personalized um, uh, habits or behaviors of students and then decipher what is wrong with each student um, learning um, ability and then we inform LLM okay say for instance the student is struggling to solve this problem because previously they have this kind of history data since LLMs cannot personalize can we use this type of learning analytics tools to personalize yeah. the question is for me. Okay. and thank you for the question so yeah, so educational data mining and learning analytics uh, for personalized learning actually is a very hot uh, topic in our field. Uh, for, for the researchers at uh, NIE, actually because uh, just now I shared with you student learning spaces uh, developed by Ministry of Education of Singapore, there was two AI systems, they are able to do this. Uh, so one is on um, uh, mathematics learning, so they are able to uh, just uh, based on how students interact uh, with the uh, learning management system, what kind of answer, and uh, they are trying to diagnose uh, what kind of a uh, strong area and a weaker area of this uh, specific students, and provide feedback to the students and also to the teachers and also the parents. 
and they are trying to push some, some of the learning resources to the students. Yeah. Another area is in the language learning. It is also done by Ministry of Education, not by NI researcher. We are not. We are trying to complement. We are not competing, right? So Singapore is very small. So uh, we also feel they are doing a good job. In now in the students' learning space, uh, students uh, before they are submitting any write up to the student uh, to to the teachers. Uh, AI provided by student learning space uh, is able to provide a grammar suggestions uh, on how to improve the language. So for the students uh, before they are submitting the real works uh, to to the teachers, and the teachers are able to access the original file as well. So this is a so at the end the teacher still is a gatekeeper. Yeah, but uh, the AI can personalize the learning, offload the teacher to a great extent. Otherwise, the teacher may not have time to correct every single things. Uh, Every uh, mistakes by the students. So I think there was there's a very fast changing field. What I feel is the things we are doing by Ministry of Education is they are doing this at the national level. It's not a small scale, one project, one school, one class of students, but the whole 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 national level. Yeah, at this moment. So for for us, we are. I think what we are able to contribute uh, is, uh, you know, an eye researcher looks like uh, we are doing some small scale, trying to do some kind of innovation, and if the idea looks like a proof of concept things uh, work very well, then ministry will do a bigger scale. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I think one last question before we just take a short break. We come back at three ten. Three ten. Yeah. Any last question for our two other three other speakers? My young Juling and uh, no kind. <laughs> Juling has said she's not answering questions. <laughs> okay, right. So I think that's all for today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will continue at three ten for the next session. One-to-one -one technology enhanced learning and opportunity for global research collaboration. It's, it's a really long paper, but a very seminal paper where it tells you how the concept was conceived. And now we know that the affordable di digital devices have given the students here the opportunity to engage in learning outside of school, anytime, anywhere, and with anyone. And the notion of seamless learning space is where to learn, when to learn, who to learn with, and what kind of tools for learning. Seamless learning space must integrate the aspect of how to learn. And this is where the IDC theory comes into play because it emphasizes on the concept of how to learn. The tenets of the IDC learning aligns seamlessly with the seamless learning space. Just to refresh your memory, if uh, you know, it has been around IDC theory for the past eight years, but if it's new to you, this theory emphasizes the importance of tailoring learning to the student's interests, which is driven by the student's interests, promoting creative activities driven by those interests and fostering a habitual culture of learning. It becomes a habit to learn for the students. The concept of seamless learning and the IDC learning. Yeah? Now, integrating both of these concepts, the seamless learning space and the IDC theory space, uh, IDC theory has spawned a new concept which Tangwai will talk to you, I'll share with you tomorrow in his keynote, which is the seamless interest driven co creator learning, SIDC learning. Yeah? From the start of our panel until now, you have been hearing about this SIDC. There are four fundamental orientations that he has actually shared with us, which is learning, harmony, and well-being, where the concept how well is introduced, equity, and environment. This paper is my response. What are my opinions about his views on these four fundamental orientations? Design practical and unique student learning experience. This is the role of the teachers who will be doing that in the seamless learning space. It's their responsibility. We hope that the teachers will be able to design this practical and unique learning space and learning experience for them. The learning element in the framework focuses on developing the student's interest. Now we know that the heart of 
IBC is about students' interests. But now with the integration of the seamless learning, how do we actually spark or generate students' interest in a seamless learning world? IBC Learning recognizes that students become more engaged, they are more motivated to create knowledge, not just to absorb the knowledge, but to become knowledge creators when they are genuinely interested in a topic. So our speakers, our four panelists have mentioned that in order to engage our students, engage and motivate our students, we need to work on the students' interests. Let's look at the first orientation yeah, that Takwai introduced in his SIDC um, framework. In this orientation, students practice learning routines, which means that it become a routine to them. They do it every day. Something that you do every day, which is meaningful to them, they are conditioned to focus and engage in the learning process. So you are conditioned to it. And once you are conditioned to it and it's repeated many times, it then becomes a habit that becomes second nature. It doesn't require you to think. It automatically makes you do or you, you are involved in that action. So this is what it means by the learning habit. Now, when we talk about the learning habit, there's something more which is beyond the learning habit. Learning habit, like I mentioned, it is second nature, but it can go into the next level, which is the learning ritual. What do you mean by learning ritual? It is more than learning habit because it revolves practices that are meaningful to the learners. Now, if you recall yourself, do you have any rituals that you do? We are not talking about the religious ritual, but rituals that you do, right? If you are a fan of uh, Rafael, Rafael Nadal, yeah? the tennis player, he has some certain rituals when he goes into court. And if you notice that, um, when he seated at the bench, yeah, he would arrange the bottles to face certain directions. That is one of his learning, one of his rituals when he's on court. And before he serves, he would be touching his nose, tugging his pants. That is his ritual. So it means that it's meaningful to him. Now, if we put that in the context of learning, when the students have this learning ritual, yeah their mind and body becomes conditioned to focus and engage in the learning process. The learning ritual is more than a learning habit. For me, I think if we are able yeah, to condition our students to have some kind of learning rituals, it becomes very meaningful to them and it makes them focus, calm for them to start to learn. Now, in the simplest learning environment, yeah? we know that it is non-judgmental. We as the teacher or we as the educator, we can make it non-judgmental where students are free to view their air, uh, express their ideas, try new things, you know, and take risks without being, uh, being punished. That's important. And the elements of confusion, now my study has actually kind of uh, discovered accidentally that when we inject some element of confusion but this element has to be well regulated we can't make our students so confused that they give up but a little bit of confusion where they would likely hold the students attention when they get a little bit confused they tend to focus more they tend to ask questions and when we are able to create that situation it leads to deeper learning Seamless in this sense is that it encourages educators to curate diverse learning resources. So there's multi-modality in terms of how we actually get the resources. Learning assessment, well, we know that when we talk about learning, of course, assessment is involved. It can be conducted more fluidly. In this situation, continuous alternative assessment, we know that the traditional is just tests, examinations, but when we talk about alternative assessments, um, the feedback can be integrated in the home and school learning environments. It's not just confined to the school and learning environment, yet it can be brought into the home learning environment, thanks to the seamless world. Yeah? And it, we can provide timely feedback and support, which means that educators, they don't have to wait until the next day to engage with the students when we talk about the assessment. They can continue in this informal learning environment. 
How well? So this is the concept that Kang Wai has introduced, and I'm sure he will talk about it tomorrow. It's from towards harmony and well-being. And the website that I shared with you earlier has more about this how well concept. Yeah? When these students are engaged in interest-driven activities, they experience a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. This aligns with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we know that when the students here yeah, have harmonious interactions with themselves, others, which are like their teachers, peers, parents, the environment contribute to the overall well-being. We know that well-being, I think Wendy mentioned about that, is one of the most important elements of learning. Yeah? And it can be considered as an effective learning outcome. How many is an effective learning outcome? When it is achieved when the student's learning needs are fulfilled. So once, once their learning needs are fulfilled, they gain a sense of satisfaction. They're satisfied with themselves and they are satisfied with what they have achieved and experience inner peace. Students feel a sense of belonging. They feel that they are wanted in the group. And being happy and eventually become, they become lifelong learners. They need to have a clear understanding to whom to connect with. This is very important because they need to connect with the right people with, who are able to guide them into this harmony environment. The next orientation is equity. Digital technologies are affordable nowadays, yeah? And access learning resources without discrimination. When we described that her son has a laptop, everybody in Singapore, secondary school, primary schools, are equipped with laptops. But not all schools, you know, have this opportunity. For example, in Malaysia, we don't have that, we haven't reached that extent yet. But for higher education students, the government has actually identified students who are considered as B40, which are the less privileged, and they are all equipped with a tablet. Which means that these advantaged students are equipped with quality digital devices for learning. There's no more discrimination and they are not left behind when they are learning. You know, they switch between the school learning environment and the home learning environment. Their interest-driven learning process is not disrupted when this switch happens between the traditional from the informal and the formal and vice versa. And what's important here is that students have equal opportunities to pursue their interests. Next is environment. We know that uh, this relates to safety and hygiene. Of course, we all went through the pandemic and in Takwai's words, the world is on the brink of peril which means that we are in the WUKA world, volatile, yeah? Um, we don't know what to expect next. But the ubiquity of digital technology is, you know, very affordable. Things have become affordable and instant gratification, continuous connectivity afforded by ubiquitous digital technologies contributed to the reinforcement of addictive behaviours. So what's important here is that we need to give importance to digital literacy and online safety. A few of my last slides. What, is, what are the implications for education? First of all, we need to cultivate students' curiosity and motivation by designing learning experiences that leverage students' interests. Seamless learning provides a platform for us to do so, and we as educators are empowered to present the learning context that pick the learner's interests, maximizing their understanding. Most importantly, students need to connect with peers, experts, and COPs. Implementing SIDC learning requires thoughtful design and responsible use of technology. This is very important. And to conclude, learning outcomes can be fortified. This is very important. Can be fortified when educators play a vital role. Who are the educators here? these people like us, yeah, school teachers and so forth, we need to support the students' well-being and create a harmonious learning environment while ensuring accessibility and inclusiveness in education. By embracing this framework, the educators can empower their own students to take ownership of their learning journey and promote the love for lifelong learning. That's all for today's uh, presentation and thank you very much for your attention. So any questions or comments? Uh, Michelle, please.
So lifelong learning is a dream actually to me, I think. Because while people start to get busy with their life, there are a lot of factors that make it hard to do lifelong learning. So this is, well, I mean, we want people to continuously learn. But there are many factors which are kind of outside this scope of framework, which is not a consideration. Right. Any thoughts on that? I think I agree. I, I totally agree with you, you know, that um, of course we want to do lifelong learning, but a lot of challenges that we face that we, we are not able to continue learning. But at the same time, I think what happens is that there's unconscious, conscious, we are unconsciously learning at the same time, even though we think we are not learning. Like, for example, when during the pandemic, we all, we had an extra time, right? We, I started to learn how to bake. I started, these are all lifelong learning skills and all that. But the challenges are there, definitely. We become busier because there's so much things to be done, not only as, at our level, but students, there are more things for them to, to learn as well. And uh, for them, it, I think it's overwhelming at times. And that affects their well-being, uh, of, of obviously. Yeah, definitely. So there's any thoughts in terms of the, the framework? Okay, right. So that's why the framework which uh, Tawa is going to share tomorrow, it's a work in progress, definitely. But we have, uh, he has put together the four fundamentals elements that we perceive that this would form the tenets of SIDC. So that's why um, by engaging with people like you, we want to hear more. What else can we actually what else can we actually do to improve this uh, framework? Definitely. Thank you. Uh, okay, just one more question. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, for life learning is not only about uh, formal learning uh, in school, but also informal learning, right? So maybe uh, when we maybe we have some problems to solve. Uh, when, uh, maybe after we leave, after leaving school, then we still have to learn something new. But uh, it, that's quite different from uh, learning in school because we don't have teachers uh, along with us. So we have to uh, try to figure out how to solve these uh, new problems. Maybe I think maybe that that's what you uh, talk about long life learning, right? Thank you, uh, Intian, for extending what I meant. I think I, Micah has given a very good example. You wanted to play the game, right? But you didn't understand Japanese. But that made you learn how to learn Japanese because of the interest that you had. But you still are able to converse in Japanese, yes? See, it, it stays with him, the language. So that's lifelong learning. <laughs> OK, uh, so I have to stop here because of the time constraint. We move on to the next presenter. So is it uh